Born in the Second Century, hosted by Chris Palmero, broadcast music Pompey Gray. This is episode 10, a reading from a letter of Pliny the Younger to the Roman historian Tacitus. You're never satisfied with yourself, but I never write with such confidence as when I write about you. And I, I don't know whether posterity will remember us, but I believe that it should. I don't mean because of our genius, that sounds like boasting, but because of our hard work, because of our studies, and because of the respect that we show toward future generations. So let's continue along the path that we've chosen, leading few as it does to the full light of fame, but dragging many out of the shades of obscurity. That was a reading from one of Pliny's letters to Tacitus, and well-scouted, if I may say. The writings of these two men contain what are thought to be the earliest external witnesses for the existence of the Christian religion. 112 AD for the letter of the Roman lawyer and politician Pliny the Younger, 117 AD for the history books written by his friend Tacitus. When they write about Christianity, the religion has a name, a recognized form, it's a recognized belief system. And it goes without saying that for a show called Born in the Second Century, it is therefore imperative to contend with them. If Christianity is so highly developed according to the testimony of these witnesses at these early dates, then it had to have originated well within that safe harbor of the first century, the harbor to which our fleet of corsairs has been sailing over the past ten months with malintent. But on our way upriver, we're met with these two sentinels guarding the way on either side, thrusting out forbidding hands, the pillars of the Argonath barring the way. For hundreds of years, they've resisted all attempts to overcome them, and they stand astride the abandoned road, blocking the way to the truth about Christian origins. Even in the 19th century, a theologian said that Anyone who doesn't believe that Jesus was a historical figure can be refuted out of a few lines of Tacitus. However, I've seen much more formidable objectives. Because for one thing, Christianity is completely unattested before this, and even for some time after this. The first century is a dark age when it comes to the historical information that we seek about this religion. I mentioned in episode 6 about how the decade of the 90s AD is treated as a sort of dumping ground that theologians use to stick a lot of their questionably dated texts like First Clement, the Didache, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Gospel of John, the first letter of Peter, with absolutely no evidence to support placing them there. The theologians survey the datable evidence they have after blithely placing the New Testament books in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s and 70s, where they think they belong. And when they survey that evidence, they encounter a signal difficulty. It is that between that time and all the way to the 130s and 140s, the internal literary evidence of Christianity is a bit lacking, to say the least. Of archaeological evidence, there's of course none to speak. So they do their best to populate this time period of the late 1st century, early 2nd century, this absolute dark age. And populating it is a bit like building a Jenga tower. Because, for example, if you put, say, the letters of Ignatius there, you then have to explain why a document that is supposedly so early now would have such reverence for the Virgin Mother of Jesus, speaking about her with such fervor as we don't again encounter until the end of the second century. If you put the Gospel of Peter here, you now have to explain why this book seems to preserve elements of the passion narrative of Jesus that appear to be even more ancient than those preserved in the Gospel of Mark. A similar argument could be made about the Gospel of Thomas, but with respect to the sayings of Jesus, and the Gospel of Thomas is often put here too, in this dark age of the late 1st, early 2nd centuries. 
So you've placed your Jenga piece in order to shore up this one rickety corner of the Tower of Christian Origins, you know, the blank slate of the 90s and 100s and 110s. But in so doing, you've removed a piece of evidence from a later part of Christian history that had really served to illuminate that period more to shore up that corner of the tower. And so those are the internal texts. There's a troubling silence in this period, the same period of Pliny and Tacitus and the period immediately preceding them. And that's why these external witnesses are so important. Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, I guess, to some extent. And don't even get me started on Josephus. I'll do an episode on those two Josephus passages about Jesus eventually, but trust me when I say that it will merely be out of a sense of obligation. It should be prima facie obvious that they're inauthentic. The one about James, the brother of him called Christ, is clearly a marginal gloss, and frankly, we didn't even need a scholarly paper to tell us that. It's a Christian formula that occurs in the Gospel of Matthew, and it occurs also in the same format, in the same text, that Origen was using in an interpolated passage about James in another part of the book. So it's like, fuck out of here. Then there's the large paragraph about Jesus from Antiquities Book 18, the Testimonium Flavianum. This is a fawning encomium to Jesus that sits right between two astonishingly unrelated passages, and it calls him the Messiah. And up until the late 20th century, This passage was usually viewed as wholesale inauthentic, but in recent decades, more and more theologians are saying that, well, maybe Josephus didn't necessarily write the kind of adulatory things about Jesus, like the kind of things that a teenage girl would post about One Direction on an Instagram fan page, but uh, some attenuated form of this passage was probably original to the text. And it's like, I'm here to tell you, if you're one of those people who believes that that some version of the Josephus paragraph on Jesus originally existed, but it just said something else originally, then you owe it to me to be much more yielding when you listen to the arguments on my show, because I've said many times that Paul's letters originally were worded differently. They lacked certain passages. Here's what I consider to be the internal stylistic or doctrinal evidence and what they may have originally said. And you better respect that if you want to claim that the same thing has occurred in the writings of Josephus. It's literally no different. But I believe that the whole passage has to be struck because it's unattested for 300 years, and it appears most likely that it was either inserted by Eusebius or by a scribe writing at his direction, since every single person who ever cites it after Eusebius is someone who is also familiar with the writings of Eusebius. But I want to make another quick point here. I said that there appear to have been little to no Christian writings produced between about 90 AD and 130 AD, if you're going by the traditional timeline. I mean, you supposedly have your Gospels and your Acts right before that era, and then a huge gulf where all we get is the book of Revelation, and then only decades later do we start hearing from Barnabas and Justin and others. Now, some have argued that, well, there were writings from that in-between period, But we no longer possess them. All we have are what was copied. I want to point out that that is a cogent argument on paper. But Christian authors from a very early date have an interesting habit of listing or referencing the works of prior Christian authors. And the books of Clement of Alexandria in particular are an absolute treasure trove when it comes to that. Because not only does he cite official Christian books, but also apocryphal books and also a slew of heretical materials none of which fall into that dark age period. And when we read witnesses like Justin, Tatian, Athenagoras, Melito, Clement, Tertullian, all of the prior Christian materials that they allude to are completely accounted for in one way or another. We may not always have the books they reference, but we are aware of where those lost books fit into the tradition. In other words, there's no like shadow tradition of Christian texts that would completely surprise us if they were found. Like when a huge cache of Christian writings was found at Nag Hammadi, we already knew the titles of a lot of those books beforehand. They'd been discussed by early theologians who were, you know, screaming about how much they hated them. We found the Peripasca of Melito in the 1940s. We already knew that some form of that book existed from the records that we do possess. I think it was 1901, we found a book called Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching by Irenaeus. And we knew that that book existed already 
Eusebius had cited the first sentence of it. And when we read the book, we weren't terribly surprised by its contents. It didn't suggest that there was like a missing hoard of Christian text of which we had no awareness and which, if found, would lend support to the traditional view of Christian origins. I mean, if anything, that demonstration book made the study of early Christianity even more complicated since in it, the dummy Irenaeus had to go off and say that Jesus Christ was crucified in the reign of the emperor Claudius in the 40s AD. But despite all this, despite the fact that this whole period is a blank slate, the honest critic must still engage with Pliny and with Tacitus, and accordingly, that's what we'll do. But before that, I want to say one more thing about Josephus. It is absolutely terrifying that so many people are starting to see the Jesus passage in Josephus as genuine in some way. I'm not going to lie. It's like the bees are dying out level of terrifying for me. Like if you told me that there was about to be another Storega slide in the next five years, I would be less concerned about that than about the fact that people are for some reason starting to trust this Josephus passage again. And what that is, it's part of a general trend in Christian apologetics and Christian scholarship. As time goes by, it's getting more traditional, more conservative, like the opposite of what we should expect and the opposite of what we see in the classics and in other disciplines. And Christian apologists are also becoming angrier, more obstinate, more rude, more insistent. And it's very difficult for me not to identify this trend of the more bitter, more angry, more traditionalizing apologist as going hand in hand with recent political and cultural developments in the United States and the United Kingdom. But those things, those contemporary events are always going to be beyond the scope of my show unless they have bearing on Christian origins. All I will say is that the increasing rudeness, the increasing obstinacy of the apologist, it's not a good look because when it comes to the evidence for early Christianity, the apologist house is not as orderly as it would need to be for them to really pull that kind of thing off. This is episode 10 of the monthly episodic serialized telebroadcast on the lateness of Christian origins and the spuriosity of the New Testament texts. The red squiggly line underneath the word spuriosity here in my notes, suggesting that it's misspelled, is belied by the testimony of the Collins Dictionary, which identifies spuriosity as a valid, albeit rare, usage. We've gone back and released a shorter version of our now legendary intro theme and have added it to all the previous episodes, replacing the extended original theme. That version of the theme, with lyrics by Tom Stallcup, can now be found at the end of episode one, where it now sits as the outro, and as always, by searching Pompey Gray on Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud. The lyrics were by Tom Stallcup, but also, to my knowledge, it was also the first ever songwriter credit for Tertullian, since he's quoted in the theme song. And I can say that with confidence, because we have already talked about Tertullian on this show more than all other Christian programs of the last 30 years combined. Now, Born in the Second Century has been doing rather well, especially lately, and so I wanted to take the time to thank all listeners and all repeat listeners, and I have to say that I do value the fact that anyone would listen to a complete episode of the show or more than one episode because one of the more vexing issues for me in my personal life has been the feedback from those whom I've told about the show but who aren't necessarily interested in the subject matter which I instantly regret doing in 100% of the cases from the very second they start asking questions. And the big one is always, why are you doing this? What's your motive? And it's like, I don't know. It's like, why does anyone do anything? I mean, didn't you see Deliverance? They rafted the river for no other reason than it was there, you know? And they had a great time doing it, and nothing bad happened to them. So I'm very much in that tradition, the tradition of those rafters. Burt Reynolds, and others. I'm only about a half hour into the film, and so far it's been great fun. But look, I would rather have 10 Christian apologists living with me in my house and constantly asking obnoxious questions like, you know, like, what about Alice Wheelie's articles? Or, you know, what about the fact that Arthur Dreffs was refuted? Uh, what about the fact that G.A. Wells ended up believing in a minimum Jesus? I would rather have to deal with that every day than these bizarre interrogations from civilians about 
why I do this and what's my motive. All this to say, even though my own life has been getting into that may you live in interesting times territory, born in the second century is a strong force for stability, and it will continue to be that for you too, if you enjoy the show, or even enjoy hate listening to the show. But today we storm the first of the pillars of the Argonath by main force, Pliny's letter to Trajan discussing the legal treatment of Christians in the early 2nd century and Trajan's response. Like I said in the last episode on this show, I usually refer to it as the Pliny letter, with Pliny's letter to Trajan and the response both being covered by that name. Letter 1096 from Pliny to Trajan and 1097 from Trajan to Pliny, written between September 18th, 111 AD and January 3rd, 112 AD, if it is genuine. I mentioned the Pliny letter last time in episode 9 toward the beginning. I then got some feedback about wanting to hear an episode on it, so here we are. Now, what is the Pliny letter? Let's do a brief summary before we embark on this luciad of criticism. In short, Pliny the Younger is serving as the governor of a Roman province in Asia Minor around 110 AD. He writes to the emperor Trajan, seeking advice on how Christians should be persecuted He's seeking a kind of legal framework. Trajan's reply in so many words is that Christians are indeed to be treated as guilty, but they shouldn't be sought out, you know, like the Nexus 6 in Blade Runner. But if they do end up before the tribunal, they should have the opportunity to deny being a Christian. And if they do that, they're free to go. Crucially, he also says that the accusations of anonymous informers against the Christians should not be heard under any circumstances. In episode one, I said that part of our approach on this show in proving the late origins of Christianity is to examine the contemporary pagan and Greco-Roman testimony, and this letter is about as contemporary and pagan and as Greco-Roman as it gets. And this letter, if it is wholly genuine, as I said, is a major threat to born in the second century. In fact, it is one of the only such threats that exist. And as we continue with, for example, the Temple of Time series, where we look at all these vague suggestions and Christian writings that the religion could have started in the first century, you'll see that we can deal with all of those fairly handily. There's nothing written in any Christian document in existence that could pull the origins of this thing back into the first century. With this Pliny letter, however, there is such a threat. But rather than gloss over it as an apologist might with something that conflicts with their paradigm, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to dive in with alacrity. We're going to dive in like St. Thecla diving into the pool of killer dolphins to get baptized. And we're going to devote as many episodes as it takes. And as always on this show, even though we cover a text, it's not the last time we can bring it up. I may even present new information about the Pliny letter someday and do a whole series on it again. I received a listener question recently, how long do I anticipate this project will be, meaning the show? And the answer is indefinite. The show will end with my death and with my ascension to the right hand of the Father when he says to me, sit at my right until whenever I might make your enemies a footstool. And I might even continue doing the show from there too, depending on the setup, you know, in heaven. Obviously, you know, we're gonna, first we have to square away the electrical and all that. Frankly, I'm looking forward to that because then there will be no birds chirping, which forces me to stop talking every five seconds. But we are here today to address a crucial pagan witness to early Christianity and to explain how and why this witness doesn't actually conflict with the hypothesis that Christianity began later than supposed. We'll do this by demonstrating that the Pliny letter is a forgery, specifically it is a Christian composition from the late 2nd century, very much in the same vein as the forged rescript of Hadrian to Minucius Fundanus, which is the spiritual predecessor to this document, and we'll also cover and explain that. This Pliny letter is part of the strategy that the Christian clerics, the mainstream Christian clerics, were creating to deal with the fact that their religion put them on the wrong side of the authorities, but at the same time, their religion also extolled the virtues of suffering and martyrdom almost as a first principle. So they ended up in this weird limbo where they couldn't take the position of outright begging the Romans not to kill them. Rather, they had to present themselves as an aggrieved party, play up the suffering and martyrdom angle to appease their mass of congregants, but at the same time, try to corral the Roman legal arguments for the persecution of Christians into a kind of a ditch, so to speak, to try to make it more manageable, 
to try to make it less indiscriminate, to influence the discourse among the Roman jurist consults so that the persecution and execution of Christians was limited in some way, prescribed within certain bounds. After all, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. But if everyone did that, this is going to be a real short trip for our new faith. And we don't know to what extent the clerics were able to do this in real time, you know, what kind of legal arguments they may have actually employed when defending themselves or their brethren when they were actually hauled before the magistrates. One would probably point here to the various acts of the martyrs that talk about this, but of course those are all about as fake as the queen's orgasms. But we do know, however, that one of the ways the Christian leaders tried to influence the Roman legal discourse on persecution was through the forgery of imperial rescripts. And we are privileged to possess several of them. They are appended to the writings of Justin Martyr, and we'll cover them in this series. Pliny's letter should be seen as another such rescript and another such forgery. I will say here at the top of the show two things. One, it is possible for me to just cop out and say, well, Christianity was born in the second century, but its antecedents in the Jewish Gnosis existed since like the reign of Claudius in the 40s and the 50s. Some of those who practiced those faiths could have been called Christians, and therefore Pliny could have been mentioning Christians here in 112. I could say that, but I won't. Instead, I'm going to brute force it and argue that the entire thing is just a forgery. The second thing I want to say is that this letter gets brought up a lot in the debate about Jesus being historical. Christ mythicists, those who believe that Jesus wasn't a historical figure, they always have an extensive section on Pliny's letter in their books. And it's like, I've never understood why, first of all, but I want to point out that even they, the radicals, rarely, if ever, consider it to be a forgery. Like, at best, they express some doubts. And Robert M. Price is an example of one of the people who do that. And this is one of the main distinctions between me and others who argue for Jesus being mythical. I, frankly, am not as concerned with that issue as with the issue of Christianity's origins being late. So where the mythicists take on a kind of bemused attitude towards the Pliny letter and kind of pick at one or two of its sentences and they show how it doesn't support a historical Jesus, for me, this letter is a potential game-ender. This is like Ruby Weapon from Final Fantasy VII descending with power. I have examined sources going back 200 years, and I can say with confidence that this will be one of the most thorough non-academic attempts to prove the forgery of the Pliny letter that does not also try to claim that it was forged during the Renaissance. And as I said in episode one, we will never default to an argument that a Christian text was forged in the modern era unless, like with Secret Mark, for example, there's a compelling reason to do so. But our objectives today are to discuss the background of Pliny and his letters and their publication. We will then introduce the arguments against the authenticity of the Pliny letter about Christians, the arguments that we'll be deploying throughout this series. They are called the Red Cards. And in the second half of today's broadcast, we'll focus heavily on one of the Red Cards, the one called Attestation. We'll discuss how the shaky provenance of the specific book of Pliny's letters, Book 10, in which this Christian's letter is found, is a cause for skepticism in and of itself. And we'll cover the barely existent testimonies to this letter throughout history as well, in Christian sources, but much more importantly, in pagan Roman sources. By the end of today's show, to say nothing of the end of this series, we want to reconsider the attitude held by the apologists and the theologians that the authenticity of this letter can absolutely never be called into question. That is their belief. And we want to know whether that is in fact merited. Is it true that as the apologists and the theologians never tire of claiming is it true that it's absolutely impossible to consider this letter to be inauthentic? Or could there be reasons for doubt? We'll begin answering those questions after this. <laughs> 
A reading from the Apology of Tertullian from the end of the second century. We find that in our case, inquiry is forbidden, because Pliny the Younger, when he ruled a province and had condemned some Christians to death and driven others from their steadfastness, was still annoyed at their great numbers and seeks the advice of the emperor Trajan about what to do in the future. Apart from their obstinate refusal to sacrifice, he found nothing else about their sacraments except that before dawn, the group would sing to Christ and to God, and they would establish one common rule, and that murder, adultery, fraud, treachery, and other crimes were prohibited. Then Trajan replies that such people were not to be sought, but punished if brought before him. A confused sentence by the very nature of the case. He prevents us to be sought as innocent, and he commands us to be punished as guilty. That was a reading from Tertullian's Apology. Uh, fam. I hope everyone's aware of this. But Tertullian, in this passage, is the only person who says that he has actually read this letter of Pliny in 1,400 years. It is probably the worst chain of attestation of all time. Now, there are people after him, like Eusebius and Jerome, who mention it, but in every such case, it's clear that they're getting all of their information about it from this passage of Tertullian. Jerome is usually worthless anyway. In this case, and in most others, he tends to follow Eusebius, so in his case, we're actually getting third-hand information. Jerome is kind of like that little kid who hangs around the neighborhood toughs, like he's someone's little brother, so the gang kind of has to let him tag along. And when the little gang leader gets in an opponent's face, Jerome is like that kid in the back hiding behind someone going like, yeah, what he said. I talked about this passage of Tertullian's Apology in episode 9, in the opening reading, when he appears to cover the Pliny letter. I said that there were two possibilities that made sense. Either no such letter of Pliny existed at the time of Tertullian and he made it up, and someone later came along and forged it based on what he said about it in this passage, it uh, sounds like it would be a fun school exercise for ancient students. Or the other possibility was that the letter indeed existed, but was forged by some Christian prior to Tertullian in this second century, which was absolutely rife with forgery. And Tertullian, of course, casually cites three other flagrant examples of forged Christian texts in this very same apology book. And it's that second possibility that is actually the theory that we have adopted as to the origins of the Pliny letter. It was a Christian forgery that Tertullian had access to in some form when he wrote at the turn of the third century. And to that point, I want to focus very briefly on some key differences between the Pliny letter as we see it printed in modern editions of Pliny and what Tertullian says here about what's in it. First of all, Tertullian says that the Pliny letter that he read, it said that the Christians were disinclined to offer sacrifices to the Roman gods. Strictly speaking, that information is not in the Pliny letter, at least in the way he's presenting it. There are also a few differences between both versions in the list of crimes that the Christians swore not to commit. Uh, Tertullian says in his copy it was murder, adultery, dishonesty, and other crimes. But the letter of Pliny that we have says fraud, theft, adultery, or falsifying or failing to produce a trust, basically a deposit. This may seem minor, but to me it's kind of baffling as to why these lists would differ so materially when both these guys were writing in the same language. And in ancient rhetoric, of which Tertullian was supposedly a master, for this type of inline citation, like he's quoting Pliny here to prove a point. If you're doing that, you're going to want a certain degree of precision. You don't want your opponents to be able to refute you out of the very text that you're citing and say, like, hey, I've got Pliny's letter right here, and he never mentions that they swore not to commit murder. I mean, maybe they were committing murder, and that's why he was persecuting them. So it's a bit weird. But like I said, we don't actually see too much other deviation between the Pliny letter that we have and the one that Tertullian claims to have read. I bring up this issue about the differences between the two versions because, as we'll see, our hypothesis is that Tertullian received this letter as part of a compilation of forged pagan documents. So the version that he was reading in that compilation may have been secondary to the original forgery. 
But why does Tertullian even bring up this Pliny letter at all? What's the context? Well, this book, the Apology, as its name implies, is a defense of Christianity. It's an updated version of a much shittier book that Tertullian had written earlier called Ad Nationes, or To the Nations. He doesn't bring up the Pliny letter in that earlier book, but he brings it up here. And the reason that he brings it up is because Tertullian has got a big mouth. He's got a big mouth because he unlike all of his predecessors who wrote about the Romans' unfair treatment of Christians, unlike Justin, unlike Apollonius, unlike Minucius, he feels the need to give an origin story for why Christians are being persecuted. This is like a strange habit that Tertullian has in general. He has this tendency to want to give the deep lore on everything, even if it's made up. If you want to know who's always putting up those citation-needed tags on Wikipedia— It's guys like Tertullian, basically. The tradition in Christianity at the time was that Christians are persecuted just for being Christians, and the earlier Christian authors were content to just leave it at that and rail against it. But Tertullian isn't satisfied with that. He feels the need to give us the deep background on why exactly that's the case. Why are Christians persecuted just for the name alone? It's this question that he feels the need to answer because, again, he's got that weird tick. It's one of the unique things about him. It characterizes all his writings. He's an over-explainer. And the answer that he gives as to why Christians are persecuted for the name alone and why is it so hard for them to clear their name and why does the Roman legal actions against them always seem so contradictory and confusing, the answer he gives is that it all comes from what's written right here in this letter of Pliny and Trajan's response. Make no mistake, the reason that Christians are persecuted for the name alone and can't clear their name in court, according to Tertullian, is because of this email thread between Pliny the Schmohawk and the August Emperor Trajan, whom, by the way, no other Christian before or after him ever seems to have had any problem with. In fact, even Dante would end up putting Trajan with the virtuous pagans in the afterlife along with Aristotle and those others. What Tertullian felt the need to do here was to construct a sort of legal background as to why Christians were being persecuted in this way. And what this means is that however this document came to him, he is approaching and interpreting it not as a Roman legal rescript, not as a matter of settled law or legal precedent, but as a literary product. He performs exegesis on Pliny's letter. The way it would work If this letter had served as any kind of precedent for the persecution of Christians, as the apologists and theologians say that it does, would be that Tertullian, if he was so concerned to tell us why the legal actions against Christians are so unfair and so confused and so contradictory, the way it would work would be that Tertullian would have produced testimony from some court proceeding that cited this letter. Otherwise, the letter is not relevant. It would be like if I said, you know, why is the pyramid with the eye on top printed on the back of American money. And the response I got was, well, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote about it in a letter to someone. It's like, yeah, and? Like, how did it actually get on the money? And the Pliny letter in the argument that Tertullian is making exists only in its own space. And it's clear that he wanted to outdo his predecessors, those early apologists, and being more meticulous giving more background to the situation that the Christians of his time found themselves in. He wanted to answer the question of why the Roman behavior toward them was so confusing, but the problem is he didn't actually know the answer. The real answer, which he in fact suspected, because he hints as much in another book of his, Ad Scapulam, is that there was no actual procedure. But like I said, he can't leave well enough alone. So he looks through his sources, and he seems to have had a book of nonsense Christian forgeries like the Acts of Pilate and some forged letters of Marcus Aurelius that had that emperor praising Christians. And in that book, there seemed to be an intriguing letter from Pliny to Trajan discussing the persecution of Christians a century before him. He knew that Pliny lived in that early time. He recognized how closely the treatment of Christians in that letter paralleled the treatment of Christians by the Romans in his own time, which was not a coincidence, because as I'm maintaining, this Pliny letter was forged only a short time before him. He read the letter and decided, hey, this looks like it could be an answer as to why we're being persecuted in the way that we are, and he presents it as such. 
The Pliny letter is floating in space. It has no referent in his own time, no apparent force of law in the Roman courts whose actions he describes so minutely. So he spins a narrative out of it and makes it kind of the origin story for the Roman procedures against Christians. And that's not to say that to him, this letter was the beginning of persecution because in Tertullian's mind, that all began with Nero, maybe even earlier. But Pliny's letter, when Tertullian read it, he noticed that it was the first chronological document to mention Roman court procedures against Christians. So he spun out of it a narrative that portrayed it as the genesis of those court proceedings. And in so doing, he has misled all later historians. Tertullian seems to have been in possession of a book that described how the Romans had treated Christians over the years. I say this because he cites a bunch of clearly spurious writings that are all nonetheless thematically related, and all of them occur in his Apology. This hypothetical book had a document that said that Tiberius wanted the Roman Senate to vote about Jesus. And crucially, this document ends with Tiberius saying, all right, you Senate jagoffs, you don't want to confirm that Jesus was a god, but I'm going to lay it down that nonetheless, no one is allowed to persecute Christians. This hypothetical book had a document that said that Nero passed a law, an institutum, against the Christians, a law that survives in no other source, not even Tacitus, who portrays Nero's massacre of Christians as more like a spur-of-the-moment thing. This hypothetical book had a document that was written by the hand of Pontius Pilate. Pilate had executed Jesus, but afterward he apparently had a change of heart, and he became a Christian, and he wrote a report about all this and sent it to the emperor. Now, Tertullian doesn't tell us this next part, but it seems like in this Pilate document, there had to have been some suggestion by Pilate that the Christians should be treated lightly because here you have even the arch persecutor of Christianity ending up having a change of heart. I mean, why else would that be mentioned in this fake source? This hypothetical book also had a document from the hands of Marcus Aurelius, a forged document. Marcus talks about how the Christians saved his army from a drought. And crucially, he ends the letter by saying, Take a shot. The Christians should therefore not be persecuted. And lastly, this hypothetical book had a document, another letter, that was written by the hand of Pliny the Younger. And that document ended with Trajan saying that the Christian faith is illegal to be sure, but the Christians shouldn't be hunted down, and especially anonymous accusations should not be heard. All of these fake documents cited by Tertullian in this apology book have similar themes. There's a vague, creeping hostility that the Roman state seems to have for Christians, but for all that, there's always a wise emperor or a wise official who throws a corollary out there and says that even though we hate these people, let's not take it too far. This was the origin of Tertullian's citation of the Pliny letter, and these documents I've described, there are three other major examples just like them from the second century that Tertullian doesn't cite but which are in other Christian sources. We will cite them later in the series, and they match this theme perfectly. All this to say, when Tertullian cites the Pliny letter, he cites it for a reason for which it wasn't intended. He has no knowledge of it being applied in Roman law. There's no hint of that. He found it in his Roman testimony book about the history of persecution, probably written or compiled by some cleric. And he simply interprets it. For him... It exists only on the page. And here is where I again remind you, Tertullian is the only person that mentions this letter until the Renaissance. And by only, I mean the only swinging dick. Now, as I said at the beginning of the show, the Pliny letter is considered to be well-nigh unassailable in terms of its authenticity. 
In fact, I recently saw a Twitter comment from an apologist who angrily told a critic, read the scholarship, no one doubts its authenticity. But I'm here to tell you, no amount of scholarship in the world can prove that this thing is genuine because what we specifically need to prove that it's genuine is a more contemporary manuscript or at least more contemporary testimony because as it stands, our witnesses to this thing are strikingly late. Frankly, what we would need is a manuscript from the mid-2nd century before Tertullian's reference to the letter comes in. We would also accept another early external witness, like a, a Marcus Cornelius Fronto-type figure, who could confirm for us that this letter of Pliny referencing Christians was already in place in the 2nd century and was acknowledged to be an authentic letter of Pliny. By the way, on that Twitter comment, that's the apologist's favorite comeback, read the scholarship. I defy anyone to go back and listen to all nine previous episodes of this telebroadcast and find any instance of me glossing over an argument by telling people to just go read something, instead of just conveying what my actual argument is. You know, telling someone to go read or to go watch something is about the laziest possible way to prove your point, but we hear it all the time for some reason in this field. Go read the scholarship is what someone says when they're insecure as to whether they themselves can prove whether something is correct. So they do like the double dare Nickelodeon physical challenge, Mark Summers. So we need a more contemporary witness. And here's the thing about apologists and theologians. They cite the Pliny letter. They quote unquote know that the Pliny letter is genuine. But for the most part, they've never actually read Pliny and hardly know anything about him. And that applies, by the way, not just to Pliny, but to other Greco-Roman authors, and not only them, but even to the Christian apocryphal writings. Those who have been fostered in that Christianity crucible from an early age, most of them have this mindset that when you're discussing Christian origins, only the New Testament is legitimate. Every other contemporary writing is useful only insofar as it bolsters the credibility of the Christian claims. And they tend to ignore pagan writings as well. It's just not something that piques their interest. They like when the pagan authors support the things about Jesus, but ignore them otherwise. You know, for the most part, I'm saying, because you do have a handful that are genuinely interested in the period. I mean, I, I'm just saying that so as not to be accused of generalizing. I mean, I personally have never actually seen it firsthand. But with me, even though I talk mainly about Christianity on here, I try not to be a slouch when it comes to pagan stuff either. So for the most part, the apologists who angrily insist on the authenticity of this letter don't know anything about Pliny, but because all they need to say is, book says the thing, they reference it in their argument and move on and don't have to delve any deeper. Not me. I essentially had to learn everything about Pliny because this is born in the second century and he's a second century guy. I have no excuse. Now, how can I be so confident in saying that the apologists who cite Pliny's letter hardly know anything about it or him? Well, it's because if you read their articles, which I have read dozens, they all repeat the same four or five facts about the letter. And the thing is, if they had read all of Pliny's letters, I mean all of them, they would have actually found a lot more in them that might actually help their case. I'll actually discuss some of that material here, but... Not necessarily at length, because, you know, it's not my responsibility to present their arguments for them. My response to them, if they want to learn more about this stuff, is go read Pliny. So, Gaius Plinius Caecilius Secundus. My main sources on him will be Wynne Williams, who did a translation and commentary on Book 10 of Pliny's letters, and Betty Radice, who did the same thing for all the letters, all 10 books. Born to wealthy landowners in Italy in the 60s AD, adopted by his uncle, Pliny the Elder, who was a top official at the time. Prolific author, now remembered for his natural history, he died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. He was a naval commander and had been trying to save some of the victims. Pliny the Younger's most famous letter is actually an account of his uncle's death, and it's, uh, I think it's one of those things that everyone should read at least once. But Pliny the Younger entered public life, practiced law, went up the course of honors, served as a praetor with duties as a treasury official. His main specialization in his government career was finance, auditing, basically. You know, today we'd call him like a forensic accountant in some ways, but he did it in a public capacity. So think of him maybe as like a top SEC official or a treasury inspector general. 
In the year 100, he served as consul, which was the highest post in the civil administration, and all the while he'd been practicing law, like I said. Roman law had some similarities to modern American law. You, you could be a lawyer in addition to your other work, though nowadays that's rarely done for various reasons, though you know people like Richard Nixon did it. And you can essentially take a case if you wanted, and Pliny served as counsel both for the defense and the prosecution in a few big corruption cases of the time. After that, he was given a kind of a cushy administrative job where he was responsible for the sewer system in Rome. And that might have been where his career ended. And even as it stands, he was notably successful for that time period. And keep in mind, too, that there was a political shitstorm going on throughout this entire time. You know, Pliny served during the reign of the emperor Domitian, who was uh, kind of a rough customer, as uh, Robert M. Price would say. And when Domitian finally got sent to go live on a nice latifundia in upstate Italy where, you know, there was plenty of room for him to run and roam and play, Pliny kept his own career going. So he clearly had some cachet. Now, in the Roman world, the basic requirements for success were that you had to be from a reasonably good background, not necessarily in the old order gentry, though, but you had to come from the correct background, which Romans would have instinctively known whether someone's background was suitably correct or not. And you also had to be at least semi-competent. You know, unlike, say, 18th century France or England or something where only one of those things had to be true at any given time. So Pliny's career could have ended honorably here, like I said, with him kind of just dithering on his estate and, you know, like calculating the appropriate water to poop ratio for the Roman sewers. But during the reign of the emperor Trajan, which began in the year 98. He was handpicked by the emperor to be the governor of a province that's now in northern Turkey called Bithynia and Pontus. I'll refer to it as Bithynia in this series. Now, there's some confusion because if you look up Pliny's title when he was heading this province, sometimes he's called the governor, sometimes he's called an official. The reason for the ambiguity is that not all Roman provinces were ruled the same way. Usually, they were led by proconsuls who ruled for one year, and they were considered to rule on behalf of the Senate. But in other provinces, the emperor was considered to rule those directly. The person that he appointed to lead the province on his behalf administered it at his pleasure, and that person was called a legate governor. And this is the capacity in which Pliny served in Bithynia. He was the first legate governor there. All before him had been proconsuls under the old system back from the heroic period. The reason that the emperor Trajan felt the need to make a change there and to appoint Pliny as the first legate was because Bithynia had been mismanaged to shit in the previous decades and its governors had all been prosecuted. Pliny had actually defended two of them in their corruption trials. So we got a real Chinatown situation here and Pliny is now coming in like Michael Bluth right after George Sr. went to prison and he's going to try to bring a new broom to this enterprise. Pliny is generally considered to be a likable figure. You know, historians like him. Uh, he's a bit self-important, a bit self-conscious in the bad way, but he always tries to do the right thing. I don't mean the good thing. I mean the right thing. And again, it's a distinction that contemporary Romans would have innately understood and valued. According to his letters, he was friends with a historian Tacitus, but Tacitus doesn't mention him in his own writings. But his existence is attested by several inscriptions in Italy, including in Comum, his hometown. And the Roman poet Martial also wrote a kind of a genial tribute to him. And Pliny is really tickled by this. He writes out the whole goddamn thing in one of his letters, and he brags that he memorized it. It's like, that's great. You know, yeah, you're likable enough, Pliny. Now, I spend a lot of time on this show talking about people not existing, a common accusation that the apologists level against me is they say that, hey, you know, why do you reject the historicity of Jesus, which was well attested, but you blithely embrace the historicity of these other schmigegis who are only sparsely attested? And that's a very good question, and I'm willing to answer it. Essentially, when you have any evidence for a historical figure, any type of evidence whatsoever, be it physical, be it literary, be it contemporary, be it from generations or even centuries later— you can always consider an alternative of two hypotheses. One is that the historical figure did not exist. The other is that they did. In this case, let's consider the evidence that we have, the example of Martial writing in praise of Pliny, 
That's Marcus Valerius Martialis, the poet who lived from about 40 AD to about 100 AD. On the hypothesis that Pliny the Younger was not a historical person, let's posit for the sake of argument here that maybe Pliny the Younger was some sort of composite creature invented by a Roman schoolmaster to kind of embody the ideal government official. On that hypothesis, we must then explain Martial's specific and detailed reference to Pliny in such a way that doesn't raise more questions than it answers. You know, the fact that there are stone inscriptions about Pliny the Younger complicates that issue further. And those are kind of rote commemorative inscriptions of the kind of which we have like four billion from the ancient world. And is there a compelling reason to accept that these were rather written about a fake person? But on the other hypothesis that Pliny the Younger was a real person, this evidence becomes much more explicable. And while it's not impossible that Pliny the Younger wasn't historical, it is more probable based on the evidence we have, that he was historical in some fashion. Now notice that I didn't even mention the evidence of his own writings, because what we have from him are 10 small books of letters and a panegyric that he wrote and delivered. And I hope you'll all appreciate that I'm being very consistent when I say that you cannot prove the historical existence of a person from the mere fact that there are writings under their own name. Now you might protest that hey, why would letters be written in the name of some nobody? I mean, for there to be pseudepigraphal letters written in the name of Pliny, there had to be a Pliny, right? Well, not necessarily. I mean, the elder Pliny was already famous, and the younger Pliny could have been invented, as I said, as a sort of a school exercise. You know, sketch the career of the plucky civil servant who doted over his circle of friends. But at a minimum... I would say that Pliny the Younger is likely historical based on the evidence from inscriptions and an eyewitness contemporary, because to me, there's no compelling alternative hypothesis that explains those things to a 51% probability. And I'm not using Bayes' theorem there, which I don't actually think applies to any of this stuff. I'm more doing the thing from civil court, you know, like the preponderance of evidence. But as to whether Pliny's letters were written by this likely historical Pliny, that must always remain an open question. You can never, ever determine the authenticity of a writing without the autographs. And in the case of Pliny's writings, I can actually think of several compelling reasons why someone might forge them, which we'll talk about. But even so, I again lean towards them being genuine, at least books one through nine of the letters, which are the personal letters to his friends. I think that the only reasonable alternative hypothesis uh, to them being genuine is that you know, they could have been forged by someone who was really keen to try his hand at a collection of literary letters to be read for enjoyment, but the forger himself didn't have much cachet, so he wrote them instead in the name of a famous figure, in this case, Pliny. But I don't think that that hypothesis meets the 51% probability test, because Pliny in these letters mentions so many contemporaries, so many of their family members, their little sons and daughters who would grow up in the succeeding decades. A lot of these are government officials who are attested in inscriptions. And we find these letters of books one through nine being referenced already in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. So it seems unlikely to me that any one of the hundreds of people mentioned in them didn't out the forger during that whole time, such that the Roman official Fronto, who references them in the 160s, wouldn't have considered them illegitimate by his time. Now, when it comes to people like Paul, Jesus, Timothy, Onesimus, Philemon, Amia of Philadelphia, Quadratus, Ignatius, there's always a motivation and often many possible motivations for these people to have been invented. And these people also have the disadvantage of not being attested by any physical evidence or by any contemporaries. The Christian tradition is nothing more than a chain of literary works produced by hostile sects fighting and feuding to the death over some issues of which we're aware, but some of which we might not even be aware anymore. There could have been a hundred different motives to invent a Paul to say nothing of a Jesus. I mean, an earthly Jesus. And then you might argue, well, these books were being read to congregations and the congregations had people in them who might have been in a position to dispute their contents. Well, not necessarily. First of all, we don't know to what extent those Christian books like Paul's letters and the Gospels were even shared with the workaday Christians of the time, you know, the unwashed hordes. 
I would venture to say that they probably weren't sitting around in pajamas and hot cocoa reading and discussing these highly tendentious and complex arguments about the nature and the role of the Torah in salvation. I mean, these are touchy theological issues, and Christians today do that in Bible study. But that is solely because of the Protestant Reformation. I mean, it's difficult to imagine now. I mean, most of the listeners of this show live in Protestant countries. You know, the U.S., the U.K., Canada, Protestant for the most part, Australia, those are the top four. And these are all places in which the individual study of the Bible is in some way ingrained in the very foundations of the culture by now. Romania is number five, by the way. Uh, Romanians listen to the shit out of this show, but everyday people did not read and study the Bible before that. And part of the reason why we think of the early church as sharing and reading and discussing the gospels, you know, like sitting on the floor of the house church, that that's an ideal that was largely created by the early Protestants and the Baptists and projected into the past. Now, to say nothing of the early Christian church order manuals like the Didascalia, the Gospels themselves, Luke chapter 4, depicts how readings may have really been done in the early church. They were done in the Jewish fashion, like in the synagogue, a select reading by an earmarked lector. There is no way that an uneducated tradesman, for example, would have been allowed to be exposed to those highly particular and controversial resurrection arguments in 1 Corinthians 15, unless it was filtered through the safe hands of an appropriate and responsible medium, a cleric. And that's by and for whom Paul's letters were written. That's by and for whom the Gospels were written. But back to Pliny's letters, the Epistulae. Books 1 through 9, and there are 10 books total, Books 1 through 9 are letters to his friends, like I said, which he preserved as a kind of literary project. They're occasional letters, meaning that they're written in reference to specific things that specifically happened at a specific time, and they are really occasional letters, unlike the ones we find in the New Testament that we are told are occasional letters. Pliny's letters are short for the most part, but some of them can be long as when he deliberately writes a very long letter to tease the recipient his friend to whom he's defending the idea of long compositions. The friend had disagreed with that. It was actually Tacitus, by the way, that he's writing to in letter 120. Tacitus had said that he preferred short writings. But even for all that, that letter where he's deliberately writing a lengthy piece just to be an asshole, that letter is still only like 120th of the length of 1 Corinthians. Now, Cicero's letters had been published, and Pliny is self-consciously emulating Cicero in some ways, but he's not publishing the letters as letters, like with Cicero's writings. With Pliny, it's more self-conscious, like he's writing them with the knowledge that they'll end up being read for leisure purposes. Now, a moment ago, we discussed the issue of whether these letters can be considered genuine, books one through nine, the personal letters. I said that the strongest evidence for them being genuine was not only that they're attested by the 160s, but that in conjunction with that, They deal with so many otherwise attested contemporary figures that if they were spurious, it's unlikely that they would have been considered authoritative at such an early date as the 160s. I think that that is a reasoned argument, which is exactly the type of argument I apply to the Christian writings. When are they attested? By whom? In what context? And what's the chain of custody? But here's the thing. A lot of times, if you say something like, Pliny's letters are forged, or even Paul's letters are forged. Uh, for some reason, you always get these like these dork professor types who are just like, ludicrous. But as much as they scoff, their arguments for their position are always surprisingly weak. And man, if I convey nothing else with this whole podcast, I hope that I convey one key thing, which is that the arguments supporting a lot of the stuff that we're all supposed to just know are so remarkably weak and sparse. It's not like something like anti-vax, where there's like so many counter-arguments against it that your scroll bar would become microscopic if they were all on one page. Or some of the more recent events of history for which there are libraries of evidence, physical, written, eyewitness, otherwise. Uh, Do you want to know what the primary argument for Pliny's letters being authentic is? Well, it's the fact that they have all these small little details where it's like, why would someone make that up or write about it? And even the the Pliny expert A.N. Sherwin-White used that argument. 
I just think that human beings instinctively, and especially the older they get, they just have this knee-jerk reaction to the words false or forged. Like, I can't tell you how many times in the past year I've told someone about this show where it was like, I explore Jesus being a mythical figure, among other things, and they're just like, balderdash. And then I'm like, you know, hey, just out of curiosity, what are some arguments against that that you know of, other than, you know, that's what the New Testament says? And, and here, I don't know why, but I expect them to bring up Josephus and Tacitus, but they don't even do that. They just say, well, I mean, we have sources. Like just last week, someone actually said to me, Jesus isn't like Santa Claus, where he's just totally made up. And I thought to myself, brother, there's more proof of Santa Claus than Jesus. At least we know that Santa Claus attended the Council of Nicaea, for example. So Pliny's letters uh, are supposedly genuine because they mention teeny tiny details that no one would ever make up. Okay, so what kind of argument is that? But as I said, we don't dispute here the authenticity of books one through nine, though we had to come up with our own damn argument to get to that point. But book 10, the letters between Pliny and Trajan, is an entirely different beast. And that's where the Christian letters occur. And we'll get to that shortly. But these are Pliny's letters, and I reread them for this. And you know what? I, I would give them five bags of popcorn. You know, it's Roman culture from that middle imperial era. You know, everything is done as if someone's watching you and checking on how virtuous you're being. It's not quite stoicism, but it's clear that there is a very strong ethical system that is acting externally on the author. Not being a good friend, not being a good host, not being a good administrator, not being a good husband. You get the sense that Pliny feels that his life would go south if he doesn't uphold those things. He says, nothing is so appealing to me as the love and longing for a lasting name, man's worthiest aspiration, especially in someone who's aware that there's nothing in him to blame and so has no fear if he's to be remembered by posterity. That sentence alone sums up Pliny the Younger. And I mention that because I'm disheartened by a lot of these new narratives about how you know, the Romans only valued aggression and manliness and you know, they kind of scoffed at spiritual stuff or they went through the motions is a big one. They didn't really believe in the gods. They just kind of went through the motions. This is a deeply spiritual culture of the highest order. It is the kind of culture that created a goddess whose sole domain was the cutting of the umbilical cord not a goddess of childbirth, which they already had, not a goddess of the umbilical cord in general, but a goddess of the cutting of the umbilical cord, who they felt apparently needed to be placated. Now, even many cultures that have been centered around nature shamans for 6,000 years would look like logic bros next to the Romans. And the less credulous among them, like Pliny, internalized those spiritual values to the careful and fastidious way of living one's life, and especially moving in one's social circle. The Roman Empire was a civilization that placed a startling importance on social interactions. But the more credulous threw themselves into devotion. The most credulous looked for an even more radical solution. And there, I'm looking squarely at the community of zealots that wrote Paul's letters. But we'll start ripping the Pliny letter to shreds after this word. next episode, we're going to begin reading the Pliny letter line by line, and we're going to have somewhat to say about every single word therein. But for now, I want to give a brief outline of my approach, the key arguments against the authenticity of the Pliny letter. I'll call them the red cards. Now, it seems very strange that I would select a term like red cards, being that it comes from a sport that only about 25% of my audience probably even likes. Based on their location, I should probably be using something like flag on the play instead. But I saw something recently about how there was a youth soccer game and there were no referees. So they drafted a six-year-old kid to be the referee. And a few minutes into the game, one of the parents started getting belligerent about some dumb thing. 
and the little kid red carded him and made him go sit in his SUV for the rest of the game. If you figure that story out, you figure it out born in the second century. So the red cards, and there are eight red cards that we'll constantly be going back to, and I'll be referring to them throughout the close reading beginning next time. Now, there's no need to like memorize these, although I will quiz you on them, and it will constitute 90% of your final score for this podcast, but I will be, like I said, referring back to these in such a way that I'll always be explaining myself thoroughly. You won't ever need to really refer back to this segment for reference. It's just to introduce all my counter arguments so you know what to expect in the close reading. So... We begin with red card number one. And again, there are eight. Number one is attestation. This has to do with the very strange textual history of the letter and its lack of mention for centuries after it was purportedly written. The letter about Christians appears in Book 10 of Pliny's letters, and we'll discuss the questionable provenance of Book 10 in this episode. Also, the emperor Trajan is supposed to be establishing a precedent in this letter for how to deal with Christians within a legal framework Yet for centuries afterwards, all the way up to the end of the empire, this precedent is never referred to again, not only in Roman sources, but even in the Christian sources who are heavily concerned with documenting cases of persecution and the treatment of Christians by each Roman emperor. They give us copies of edicts from emperors from Hadrian to Antoninus to Marcus to Septimius Severus, Decius, Diocletian, Licinius, Galerius, some are forged, some are genuine, But at no time do any of those edicts cite Trajan's communication with Pliny, which would have had the force of law, nor do these edicts appear to be even aware of its existence. And this, for a change, is not the typical argument from silence, where just because someone doesn't mention something doesn't mean it didn't happen. This is a matter of legal precedent, where the statement, if it's not written, it didn't happen, actually obtains for once. Now, red card number two against authenticity is what I call the persecution trope. The early Christians developed a mythology surrounding their own persecution to make it appear more dramatic, more systemic, whereas it was actually a sporadic and local affair, and sometimes the state didn't even have anything to do with it. But because the story of Jesus and some of the individual sayings of Jesus in the tradition provided such ample exhortation to suffering and martyrdom, It became necessary for the early Christians to imagine themselves as the victims, not only of a state conspiracy, but a conspiracy instigated by demonic forces in which Christians were guilty simply for being Christians, punished for the name, the nomen. This, despite having no corroboration from secular sources, is everywhere in the Christian writings of the period. The ancient Christians give us a sequence of events that goes like this, and it's repeated dozens of times. They are accused first of unspeakable crimes called the flagitia, which are orgies and incest and even cannibalism. They're hauled before the authority figures where suddenly they're being accused not of these crimes, but of the name, i.e. they are charged simply with being Christians. Now, modern theologians like to run interference at this point and say that, well, what the Romans were really accusing them of was belonging to a so-called illicit religion, or belonging to an illegal association or a legal club. That's not what the Christian sources say, because more often than not, the Christian writers are well aware of those types of accusations, especially the one about illegal clubs. But tellingly, they do not state that that is what they're being accused of. They say that they are being persecuted for the name. They're then given an opportunity by the authorities to recant, to apostatize, to sacrifice to the emperor, the traditional gods, to disavow their faith, But just like Jesus, who didn't defend himself at his own trial, they go willingly down the martyr's path. This is the persecution trope. For reasons we'll get into next time, it only makes sense within a firmly Christian context and a firmly Christian worldview. This whole legal procedure, if you want to call it that, would have been like divide by zero error to a Roman jurist consult and Pliny's letter happens to be the James Joyce Ulysses of the persecution trope. Another thing on this, Pliny discusses three types of Christians that fall into nice, neat categories. The very same three categories that the third century church was beating its brains over how to deal with them. The confessors, who were formally prosecuted. The deniers, who were accused by a broadsheet. And the apostates, who were named by an informant. It's like Matthew Broderick writing on that chalkboard in election, you know, like legislative, executive, judicial. 
And here we have confessors, deniers, apostates, three distinct classes of Christian, three distinct types of accusation. Even learned commentators on this letter have said that Pliny is probably oversimplifying here for him to be naming the exact three specific types of persecuted Christians that the ancient church debated about internally and having them each be denounced by their own unique means. I said earlier that the purpose of this forgery was to steer the contemporary legal debate to an outcome that was more favorable to the church. And in that vein, here we see a precise categorization of Christians of a type that would be insignificant to Pliny. I mean, he already seems to perceive that Christianity itself is a crime. None of these categories, except maybe the apostates, should really matter to him, much less so the means of accusation. I mean, as far as he's concerned, from what he's made to say elsewhere in the letter, if you end up in front of me and you happen to be a Christian, I'm coming for that ass. But this careful, logical division of the persecuted Christians into three unique groups, three unique accusation types, is actually the major indication that this letter has been forged. It not only tips the hand of the forger as to his purpose, but it has him put words in the mouth of Pliny that, logically speaking, he would have no reason to utter, but which would have been of surpassing importance to Christians, especially Christian clerics of the late 100s AD. And that will require a careful explanation, and we will get to that. But for now, that was red card two, the persecution trope. Red card three is what I call peculiarities of the style. First of all, length. You know, so they say it doesn't matter, but this letter is uncharacteristically long. And what's interesting about that is that this is not even the only complex legal issue that Pliny writes about in book 10, and it's not even the most complicated one, even among those. A very similar letter, which I believe actually served as one of the models for this Christian letter, and it's about what are called foundlings or foster children. Pliny uses the Greek term threptos, and we'll talk about that letter in this series. It represents a much more thorny legal conundrum, and Pliny and Trajan are made to deal with that rather handily. But also the style and the tone of the Christian letter. Pliny's strategy for writing this letter appears to be to convince Trajan to give Christians the chance to apostatize, to abandon their faith. But the forger of the letter seems to forget that at times because he's so interested in cramming in all this incidental information that the letter ends up being like a, a Frankenstein's monster of stitched together Christian tropes. The forger is very inconsistent when it comes to his rhetorical aim. Now, on the subject of Christian tropes, Pliny is also made to say in this letter that he is sure that his strategy against the Christians will definitely wipe out this religion in the next few months. And after that, we'll never hear of them again. You know, come on, man. Another thing on this, Pliny, in at least two other letters, asks Trajan if Trajan can provide a precedent. In the case of Christianity, there simply had to be a precedent because, again, Pliny knows enough about Christians to know that they're in some way worthy of execution already. But in those other examples where they're discussing precedents, they take it very seriously. They cite letters of Domitian, edicts of the Emperor Nerva, uh, prior laws. They quibble over the law of Pompey that, that was actually like the Bithynian constitution. But here, uniquely among these letters in which Pliny is stabbing for a precedent, he gives none to Trajan and receives none from Trajan. Unlike all the other letters in Book 10, they are operating here in a legal black hole. It's because the forger knew that there were no precedents for them to discuss. The reason that the forger has Pliny ask for a precedent, which is what he does when he says at the beginning, I have not been to any trials of Christians, so therefore I need to know what the procedure is. The reason he has Pliny say that is because if he didn't, the letter would never get off the ground. It's priming the pump, so to speak, and it's a marker of inauthenticity. There are other places in Book 10 where the way to tackle a problem isn't really clear, but in those cases, Pliny just straightforwardly asked for advice. Here, the forger can't have him do that because he has to keep up the fiction that there were already specific laws on the books concerning how to persecute Christians. Red card four, peculiarities of the situation. Pliny is completely unfamiliar with trials about Christians despite having a storied legal career in Rome. Trajan does not actually respond to what Pliny asks him in the letter. In fact, it almost looks as if the forger wrote Trajan's response first and then wrote Pliny's letter behind it. And 
Trajan also doesn't give a reason for agreeing with Pliny's recommendation that the best way to deal with Christians is to spur them to apostasy. The reason for that is the forger assumes that the reader will already know about the persecution trope. Red card five, the lack of incidents of Christianity. Now, we are told in this letter that there are some very old Christians in the area. We are told that some of the Christians claim to have left the faith as many as 25 years before. And this scene occurs in northern Anatolia, in Bithynia, around 110 AD, in and around the city of Amastris. And the Christians are already being called by the name of Christians by the author. So we would have to accept the following. As early as the year 85 AD in the province of Bithynia, in the city of Amastris, there were people who called themselves Christians, a name which is not actually attested until about the mid-2nd century. And not only that, but there were enough of them to stir up major trouble in this region. And for this, we're going to look, among other things, at statistical models to show how far-fetched this scenario really is. Red card six, mere anachronism. There's the copious use of the term Christian, like I said. Pliny knows of church officials called deaconesses, which is always a red flag for a late date. He refers to the Christian services as sacramentum, which we wouldn't hear again until the later Catholic Church. He tells us that the Christians sang responsive hymns, which sounds suspiciously like the much later Catholic liturgy. And he says that those hymns were directed to Christ as to a god, which is damn cagey language that sounds like it had to go through the ringer of the early Trinitarian controversies before it showed up in our text. Red card seven, intertextuality. The Pliny letter, like the letters of Ignatius, like the Acts of the Apostles, knows that condemned Christians who are also Roman citizens should be sent to Rome for trial, even though in other letters, Pliny tells Trajan that he's sending condemned Roman citizens to the location that Trajan is actually in because the whole point is they can appeal before the emperor, so they have to go where he actually is. It is in the Christian tradition where the journey of the condemned to appeal their case was indelibly associated with the city of Rome. Another thing, Pliny says that the local economy was suffering because the Christians weren't buying sacrificial victims, a striking parallel to the Ephesus stories in Acts of the Apostles. Pliny describes the Christian service as consisting of an oath and a hymn in a passage that closely parallels the writings of Justin Martyr. And Trajan is made to use the exact language that he had already used in previous letters when he says that certain actions are out of keeping with the spirit of our age and it's not possible to set a fixed standard, which he also said verbatim when he said that it's not possible to set a fixed standard as to whether the local senator should pay an entrance fee. And lastly, red card eight, the low-key Christian propaganda of the letter itself. Pliny tells us that it is said that a true Christian would never offer sacrifice to the emperor. He gives us the testimony of the lapsed Christians who say that all they ever did wrong, if anything, was to meet together and sing a hymn praising Christ and to swear an oath never to commit a crime. And he's made to warn Trajan that If this problem isn't nipped in the bud, people of all ages, all ranks, all genders are and will be endangered. Now, if that last statement is true, just as an aside, we should expect the Romans to have written about Christianity far, far earlier than they do, far, far earlier than this, far earlier than when Lucian talks about them 50 years later after Pliny and makes them sound like the fair play for Cuba movement at that time, you know, just a couple of whack jobs. But we will examine the letter in detail, and we'll frequently refer back to the eight red cards. And I say there are eight, but as you can see, each one has at least three or more elements to it. And these are our weapons of war. And to Pliny's letter, we now issue the charge. Evacuate your civilians, because I propose to move immediately on your works. Back after this. (laughs) 
We'll spend the rest of today's show talking about red card number one, which is attestation. You, know, you always start with the easiest thing first. It's kind of like in that one video game, Mega Man X. You always want to start with a chill penguin stage because you know that's the easiest level. Or like in that game, Bart's Nightmare, where you get the choice of what doors to go through. You always want to try to go through that blue door, which is the Bartman stage. Now, many believe that the Pliny letter about Christians is unassailable because it's protected in this giant fortress called Pliny's Epistulae. But that's not the case because the Pliny letter about Christians is in book 10 of those Epistulae. Books 1 through 9 were Pliny writing to his friends. Book 10 is his letters to and from Trajan when Pliny was serving as legate governor of Bithynia. Now, he asked Trajan for advice about things like whether there should be firemen, uh, whether it's okay to build a bath, whether it's okay to rebuild a bath, whether it's okay to use an expired postage stamp. I'm not kidding, those are real letters. Whether it's okay to build a bath on top of sacred ground, uh, the ground had been consecrated to the Emperor Claudius, he asked him for permission to let his wife go visit her aunt. Now, books one through nine were published most likely by Pliny himself in the early second century. We start seeing them referenced a few decades later and throughout the next few centuries by Macrobius and so on. But even Jerome actually references books one through nine but and not book 10. But other than the passage from Tertullian that we read earlier, book 10, these letters back and forth between Pliny and Trajan are not mentioned for 14 centuries. Now, first of all, no one knows at all how this book came together and who put it together. In the commentators I was reading, they each said a different thing. Now, of the 74 letters that Pliny writes to Trajan in this book, the book also includes replies from Trajan to all but 11 of them and specific, detailed, not to say intertextual, replies. Now, whoever published this book would have needed permission to publish Trajan's replies because up until the death of Commodus, all the Roman emperors were members of Trajan's family, at least officially, you know, they were his descendants. And we have no record of any such transaction of someone getting permission to publish these, even when we do have all kinds of administrative minutiae from the second century, nor are these cited or mentioned in any Roman sources that we have. Publishing the ex cathedra statements of Trajan would require one to navigate some administrative hurdles, and we have no record of that. One theory is that Suetonius published Book 10 of Pliny's letters because Suetonius would have been in a position to do so because he was one of those official secretaries, the ones that I mentioned in Episode 9. You might as well say that the historical Jesus published Book 10. I mean, why not? You have just as much evidence of that being the case as you do with Suetonius. But I mentioned that no one acknowledges this book for 1,400 years. Well, book 10 suddenly appears out of nowhere when it's first published in Venice in 1502 AD. Another edition, a more correct edition, was published a few years later. The printed book was based on a manuscript that contained all 10 books of Pliny's letters, and it's now missing. We only have a few sheets of it left. It's there in the Pierpont Morgan Library in New York. I guess someone in the 1500s really needed those other sheets to write something down. Uh, I hope it was important, and that's all I'll say about that. But that manuscript, the now missing manuscript, was based on an edition that was printed all the way back in the 5th century. It's the one I mentioned last time in the opening reading. It was published after the death of Sidonius Apollinaris, a Christian who was a Pliny fan and had read the 1st through the ninth books of the letters but knew nothing about the 10th, and therefore he didn't even know that Pliny had ever referenced Christians. But like I said last time, he started a kind of Pliny trend at the time. Shortly after his life, Book 10 was published along with the other nine books for the first time. That was back in the late 400s AD. And it's that copy, that long lost copy, that's the basis for our modern text. The style of Book 10 is markedly different than the style of books one through nine. And of course, many would say that, well, these are now letters to the emperor. So Pliny's got to be a bit more formal, but it's quite jarring how different the tone is. Like Pliny in books one through nine is like the kids in the beginning of Super Troopers before they get pulled over, like how they're talking. And, and his tone in book 10 is like those same kids, but when the cop was actually in their face. Now, the letters in book 10 also presuppose the letters in books one through nine. And of course, some would say that, well, the same guy wrote all of them. So it makes sense that he would be referencing a lot of the same stuff. But 
Book 10 sometimes gives you the impression that it's almost a companion piece written by someone who assumes that the reader will already be familiar with the first nine books and can say like, oh, hey, you know, he talked about that guy again. Like in the first nine books, he'd been corresponding with Suetonius, for example, whom we know as the author of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars. And in book 10, he asks Trajan to grant Suetonius some special privileges. He does the same thing for his friend Voconius Romanus, with whom he corresponded in the other books. Calpurnius Macer, another friend of Pliny's whom he'd wrote to, also comes up a lot in Book 10. In Book 4, he wrote to his wife's grandfather about how he was ready to fund the building of a temple in the town of Tifernum near his home. And in Book 10, he references the same thing again when he asks for permission to add a statue of Trajan to the temple. In other words, Book 10 appears to be in dialogue with the first nine books as a whole. And it all seems a bit too nice and neat, especially if, as many believe, Pliny didn't prepare Book 10 for publication himself. It almost seems at times like a literary creation designed to reward careful readers who enjoyed the first nine books and will take pleasure in identifying all these little connections that Book 10 makes with them. Wynne Williams, who believes that Book 10 is authentic, nonetheless points out a few other objections that have been raised against its authenticity. He says that in one exchange, Trajan specifically asks Pliny to follow up and inform him about a trash management issue and also about the status of a theater, but he never does. Trajan said, it would be sufficient for me if you let me know your decision. And we get crickets from Pliny. And this is despite the fact that not only are the letters in sequential order, but Pliny diligently follows up on much more and much less pressing issues elsewhere, like, you know, probably like whether to build a bath. He's a big bath guy. Now, some may say that, well, maybe Pliny never did follow up on those issues, but in that case, the compiler kind of makes him look like a dope, like he didn't perform his duties properly. Imagine someone in like Nicomedia reading these letters and being like, hey, why didn't this jackass ever follow up on our trash problem? Also, another major thing, the letters are not dated. And official documents in the Roman Empire weren't not dated. But again, some might say that, well, the the letters from the first nine books didn't have dates either, and this compiler was trying to make them all uniform. It's possible, but the dating of ancient letters occurred in the body of the text. It wasn't written up in like the corner like we do it. So it seems to me that given the choice, if they were genuine letters with dates in them, the compiler would rather have just left that in especially the Trajan letters. I mean, you're telling me that this guy had permission to edit and delete things from the official statements of an emperor? Another thing, Trajan refers to Pliny a lot of the time in these letters as dearest or carissime. Not a lot of precedent for the use of that term in official letters. Similarly, Pliny refers to Trajan in these letters many times as domine or my lord, whereas In his one surviving writing outside of these letters, the panegyric that I mentioned, it's written in praise of Trajan. And in that speech praising him, he literally says that because Trajan holds the place of a prince, there's no longer a need for any lord or dominus. That is a backhand across the face of the emperor Domitian who had recently died. And Domitian was hot in a biscuit to be referred to as lord all the time. It it just seems strange that Pliny, who is on record as saying that Trajan has now obviated the need to use the term Lord, is now choosing to call him that in every single sentence. I'm sure that if we rack our brains very carefully, we could think of at least one ancient organization from that time that habitually used the term Lord that may have produced someone who could have forged these letters. By the way, Pliny, if you remember, made his career under Domitian, but then within months of his death, he's acting like he hated him all along. He's like, Finally, those capitalist pigs will pay for their crimes, eh? Hey, comrades, eh? Augustus and Tiberius had both made a very ostentatious point about not wanting to be called Dominus. If it was the convention in Trajan's time for him not to be called Dominus, then if the letters were forged, they were forged by someone who did not know that that was the case during Trajan's time. However, it could also be that once Trajan died in 117 AD and was deified, then if the letters were forged even shortly after his death, the forger would probably feel weird about not using the term dominus. It's, I mean, like, now you're talking about a god. You know, you don't want to have your Pliny character calling him Brosov or whatever. But I have been hinting all this time that book 10 of Pliny's letters might have been forged in its entirety. And 
That is not even close to being a consensus view among Pliny scholars. In fact, when Williams brought up a lot of those arguments against authenticity specifically to shoot them down, I myself think that while there's not a compelling alternative hypothesis to explain Pliny's personal letters in the first nine books, I could certainly envision a scenario in which a forger created book 10. Because here you have a trusty administrator asking for advice from the emperor, and we could see it as like a sort of guide for civil magistrates, especially those who have to be in close communication with a superior. You know, the idea being, here's the sort of things a civil magistrate should write about. Here's what he probably shouldn't write about. Because there are a number of examples in here where Trajan is made to say like, you know, like hey, moron, you don't have to ask me whether it's okay to invite senators to a party like he does in letter 116. However, having said that, I will actually defer to the experts here and agree that book 10 is genuine in some way, meaning that it goes back to authentic correspondence between Pliny and Trajan, though we may have to put a small asterisk next to that. But having said that, I do not believe that letters 96 and 97, the one from Pliny to Trajan about Christians and Trajan's response, were part of book 10 originally. I believe that they were slipped in when the complete edition of the letters was first published in the late 5th century, the time in which Christianity was the state religion of the empire, the time after the reforms of Theodosius had long since taken hold. And why we've spent this time discussing Book 10, which goes back to our first major argument against authenticity, our first red card, which is attestation, is to show that Book 10 of Pliny's letters was not kept under heavy guard surrounded by the laser tripwire and the pressure plates. It has a shaky, confusing provenance, which makes it more plausible that someone could have slipped in these two Christian letters, which, by the way, are long as shite, longer than anything else in Book 10. Book 10 wasn't published with the main letters until the 5th century by a Christian after the time of Sidonius Apollinaris. No one mentions Book 10 for 14 centuries when it shows up in the incomplete Hieronymus of Vontius edition in 1502. No Christian commentator mentions the letter that entire time unless they're following Tertullian's extremely brief and cagey treatment of it. And its chain of attestation hangs by a spider's thread. It's not impossible that the forged Christian letters, forged in the late 2nd century and circulating as part of this strange testimony book that seems to have been in Tertullian's possession and were written by Christian forgers in the spirit of the forged rescripts of Tiberius and Antoninus and Marcus Aurelius and Hadrian, it's not impossible that these could have been scooped up in the 5th century and folded into the manuscripts of Book 10. And that is the unofficial motto of this Pliny series. It's not impossible. So we've introduced the Pliny letter and we've introduced the eight red cards that we are deploying against its authenticity. Think of them like the eight rings that were given to mortal men. You know, of course there were nine rings, but I got to keep one of them as a reward for the important work I'm doing. Attestation, the persecution trope, peculiarities of style, peculiarities of situation, lack of incidents of Christianity, mere anachronism, intertextuality, and low-key Christian propaganda. We spoke at length on the shady history of Book 10 of Pliny's letters where these troublesome texts are found. By addressing this crucial pagan witness to Christianity forged by clerics of the late 2nd century to steer the Roman discourse on persecution, we are defending a significant threat to our theory of late Christian origins. It's also part of our general approach to prove the late origins of Christianity by examining not only the internal religious writings, but the external pagan testimonies as well, and to demonstrate that these too may have been compromised at the hands of Christian scribes. Even now, we might already be doubting the attitude held by the apologists and the theologians that the authenticity of this letter can absolutely never be called into question. I'm confident that our doubts will only increase as we move forward in the coming weeks. In the next episode of this series, we will proceed with a close reading of Pliny's letter, but suffice it to say for now, as always, that in the name of St. Candida, we declare this writing to be late and spurious. Thank you for listening. This criticism is ended. Go in peace. <laughs>
What are the stories of mythology do you think of as historical reality? 